So I told this duck that I was going to explain the heme kinase routine again, and he did the only rational thing possible. Well, he's a duck. He's, he's ducking. So the way that I went off the rails with trying to explain this in class was I started at the wrong end of the problem. What I need to do first is explain this bit down here uh, about the heme kinase and about the two things that it's working with the active and inactive forms of the eukaryotic initiation factor 2. So this EIF2 is the important part of the story, and that's the part I skipped over and why the rest of it wouldn't make any sense. Uh, it's required for initiating translation down here. It's one of the factors that's required uh, for getting translation to start. Thus the name eukaryotic initiation factor 2 uh, and, and so it's going to be the regulation point for whether or not we translate these messages or the rate at which we translate these messages. The heme kinase phosphorylates it and turns it from the active form over here to the inactive form. Heme kinase itself is being regulated by the amount of heme, and you can see here it's being inhibited by heme. Okay, so that's the important part of the story that I was missing. Now we can think about this as a way to regulate the balance between heme production and globin production in response to whether or not we have enough iron. So somebody who has plenty of iron, like in this picture, uh, has lots of transferrin receptors or relative number of relatively uh, a normal number of transferrin receptors out here on the uh, on the surface of the cell, and it's picking up transferrin loaded with iron, bringing it into the cell and everything's humming along very nicely. The iron's being uh, incorporated into uh, the heme molecules. We're getting iron loaded into heme and heme loaded into globin, and we've got a nice balance going here where we're translating just enough globin protein and making just enough heme that we can make a good, successful red blood cell. Okay, then th in this case, the heme is inhibiting the heme kinase, and preventing it from inactivating the eukaryotic initiation factor 2. Everything's going along fine. Now when we consider, we consider the case uh, where we don't have so much iron, remember, because there isn't much iron, we're going to get lots of transferrin receptors made, and they're going to sit up here on the membrane like little birds with their mouth open there, saying, give me iron, give me iron. Uh, but there's just not that much iron in the blood, uh, so these guys are coming in, coming up empty-handed most of the time. That means that there's not enough iron being delivered to the cytosol. There's not enough of this heme being produced. So the level of, of completed heme molecules drops. Now there's no sense making a bunch of, of globin if there's no heme to match it with. So uh, the way the system works is since the, the level of heme has dropped, now there's less inhibition of the kinase. The kinase activity goes up. Uh, that's a terrible arrow, but the kinase level goes up. And now we do get a lot of inactivation. The eukaryotic initiation factor is its substrate. It gets phosphorylated. Uh, we stop translating, so that inhibits translation of the globin. And that's appropriate because we don't have any heme to match it with. And the ultimate outcome is we get very low levels of hemoglobin being synthesized and red blood cell development doesn't succeed. We end up with uh, a bunch of red blood cells that don't have the normal level of heme in them. So hopefully that makes more sense than the way I tried to explain it in class. Uh, and that's the story of how we can match uh, the level of globin synthesis with the amount of heme that we produce.